lecture five in the evolution series. This video takes a look at the chapters on both anatomical homology as well as molecular homology. So as a reminder, these chapters are focused on answering the question, do all living things have a single common ancestor? In other words, is the second definition of evolution, universal common descent, a valid definition? In your book, they examine two different views, a monophyletic view, mono meaning one, one tree of life versus polyphyletic, meaning many trees. So what is an anatomical homology? Essentially, when we look at um, the anatomy or structure of the bodies of different organisms, sometimes we see that the way that they're built structurally is similar even though they carry out different functions. So one common example that's often given is uh, the limb of a vertebrate. So for example, a bat wing, the flipper on a porpoise or dolphin or whale, the leg of a horse, the arm of a human. If you look at the bone structure of those, we see a similar pattern where the upper arm or limb is has one bone, the humerus, and then that divides into the forearm, which is split into two bones, the radius and the ulna, and then finally the end of that limb, or the hand and wrist structure, is many bones. So that common pattern of one to two to many is seen in all of these different animals within um, vertebrates. And so the argument is the reason that there is a similar bone pattern is that they're, they share a common ancestor. So according to Darwinian theory, again, Darwin explained this similarity in bone structure as a result of descending from a common ancestor. And that's also held by neo-Darwinists today. But just because something has a similar structure, the implication that they also share the similar genetics that produce that structure and the similar developmental pathways, um, that's the question. So if something is a result of common ancestry, then you would expect that it's produced by similar genes and produced by similar developmental pathways. However, when we look at specific structures and examine the genes that are responsible for determining those structures, as well as how they develop in terms of the embryo, we see some differences. So one of those examples is looking at the body segments of both a wasp and a fruit fly. Many biologists say that those body segment patterns um, are produced by um, homologous developmental pathways. However, when we look at them closely, we see they're actually produced by different pathways. And sometimes the opposite's true. We find the very, very similar genes within two organisms, but the end result is a structure that doesn't look anything like um, the other. One example of that would be the eye that's produced by um, these Pax6 genes the eye that we find in mammals and insects and cephalopods. Cephalopods are things like a squid or an octopus. Um, the, the gene is very, very similar, but the end result is drastically different. So the, the big picture here is that if you look at structures and they look similar, it doesn't necessarily tell you about the genetics and the developmental pathways behind them. And so those similarities may not be as a result of ancestry at all because sometimes we find similar structures that are produced by genes that are totally different, therefore wouldn't have shared inherited genes. And then we also find things that are very similar genetically, which could you could make that argument for ancestry. However, the end result is two very different structures. Another example would be um, if you look at the insect known as a mole cricket versus the mammal the mole, um, we see that their, their front feet um, or claws are very, very similar. And so here's an example of two animals that look very similar, but um, when you look at their what's proposed for their common ancestry, we see that their ancestor or what's proposed to be their ancestor did not have this. So this would be an example of how did these two 
creatures both develop the same structures, however independently of each other, how would a random process produce that? And instead, maybe if you look at similar structures, instead what we're seeing is that there's certain patterns that work well functionally. And so maybe just simply because of the laws of nature, there are a limited number of patterns that work well. And so those are the patterns that we see. And so the repetition is really just a, a result of what's functional. The next chapter looks at homology comparisons only on a molecular level, so comparing DNA sequencing. And so remember that um, DNA, the sequence of nucleotides, give instructions for amino acids, which then assemble into proteins so that we can compare protein structures of different organisms and compare the amino acid sequences, and that should tell us something about the DNA behind that. And so the, the greater the difference in DNA from two different organisms, the argument goes the longer the time since those two organisms shared a common ancestor. So here's an example of an analysis done for three different species, a starfish, a crab, and a snail. And each letter represents an amino acid. So again, amino acids linked together form a protein. So we're comparing protein structure by comparing the sequence of amino acids. And so when you compare um, two species and you see that there's 20% um, difference or 10% difference, that can allow you to create one of these branching tree type diagrams to show similarity so that the things that are that branch off from each other later are more similar than things that separate earlier in the tree. So here's the big idea with this. When you create these tree structure diagrams based on anatomy, so looking at body plan body structures, you get one tree. But then when you compare the DNA sequence, you get something totally different. So the question is, is if these similarities are the result of ancestry, shouldn't you get the same answer both times? And the reality is that depending on what you're comparing, you get some very, very different results. And so here's an example of just simply looking at different genetic sequences producing different results. So it's not just anatomy versus genetic code. When you compare different codes, you get different results. And so the results are very inconsistent. And so, again, here's a quote highlighting that from um, an evolution textbook that, that acknowledges that analyses based on different genes and even different analyses based on the same genes, meaning that you send it to different labs and the way they look at it, slightly different, they get different results, produces a diversity of trees. So the trees don't match which gives a very different picture of ancestry depending on each result. And so again, the argument says, well, wait a minute, if all life shared a common ancestor, then shouldn't the trees agree? Shouldn't the studies based on molecules and the studies based on anatomy produce similar results if they truly are reflective of a common ancestor? And so since those trees don't match, what does that tell us? Maybe these shared structures or shared DNA sequences really aren't truly the result of common ancestry. And so a summary of this argument is that molecular trees often conflict with trees that are produced based on anatomy. And then even different molecular comparisons produce inconsistent results. And so because of these inconsistencies, the question is, do those similarities really reflect common ancestry? And this concludes Lecture 5.